Chicago Public Radio. This is Odyssey. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Shortly after the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, certain writers began to proclaim the death of postmodernism. Why? Surely, their argument went, no reasonable person could contend that flying a plane into a building and killing thousands of innocent people was only wrong from a particular perspective, the view ascribed to postmodernism. The manifest immorality of the attacks, the argument continued, would discredit all such relativism and its allegedly demoralizing effects on American resolve. One postmodernist in particular was outraged by all this, Stanley Fish, who is Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Illinois at Chicago, has written and spoken against this condemnation of postmodernism several times since last fall. His argument, or part of it anyway, is that a person's answers to a set of philosophical questions, be they postmodern answers or not, have no bearing on that person's willingness to act or to judge in a given concrete circumstance, such as the war on terror. In other words, Philosophy doesn't matter. Is this right? Is it right in general, and is it right in the particular context of the war on terror? Well, the argument rages on here on Odyssey today. We'll be joined for the conversation today by Stanley Fish, who will join us in just a moment from Woodstock, New York. From Boston, Massachusetts, we're joined by philosopher Joshua Cohen. Joshua Cohen, let me ask you to get us started in your view. Is the answer, or is a person's answers to a set of philosophical questions the beginning point for determining action? I don't think there's any general answer to that uh, question, Gretchen. People ha can have very deep philosophical disagreements and arrive at the same answer to a moral question like the uh, Im manifest immorality of flying planes into uh, buildings and that was clear after September 11th there were people who condemned that attack who came from every religious point of view and every philosophical point of view so the philosophical disagreements um, were entirely consistent with an agreement on the uh, practical question people had different starting points but in this case virtually all roads led to Rome Rome here being the condemnation of that attack as uh, immoral okay but that's what I want to know I mean do you start in order to get to your conclusion even if people starting from different points come to the same conclusion is it that your philosophical answers will will lead to the conclusion in other words are they connected to what you conclude on a particular issue I think there is some connection to what you conclude on particular issues and it's partly why philosophical convictions matter a great deal to people I would only add to that that philosophical disagreement is consistent with agreement on the practical moral uh, issue uh, at hand. But I think it's very important to people uh, outside of the philosophy classroom that there be some kind of fit between their deeper philosophical convictions, often with religious foundation, although sometimes with more secular foundation, some kind of fit between those deeper convictions and uh, their answers to particular uh, moral questions. And I think it's important to lots of people to be able to defend their answer to a, a live moral question with uh, a, a deeper argument founded on more general principles that they're prepared to apply to other cases. Stanley Fish, why do you argue that your, a person's answers to philosophical questions do not have consequences for actions? Well, first, in order to answer that question, I have to uh, uh, agree with uh, Professor Cohen uh, that one always often has recourse to deeper arguments. I guess I would be insisting that some deeper arguments to which we might have recourse are not philosophical. For example, we might believe, and I do, in the rule of law, uh, or one man, one vote, or in equal opportunities uh, independent of anyone's race, religion, uh, or uh, country of origin, ethnic origin. All of those are general beliefs which we might usefully uh, apply or have recourse to when we had to make a decision about whether to vote or how to operate in our own context. None of those, however, are points of philosophy. They are substantive 
ethical or political positions. Can I ask you to define a little more clearly the line between ethical and philosophical? Well, sure. Uh, by philosophical, I mean, as I, I said in the response uh, in in the response of community piece, epistemological arguments, epistemological arguments of the kind that issue, uh, let's say, in a theory of truth. A theory of truth might say someone who had a theory of truth might believe that truth is a matter of correspondence to facts that are independently available and specifiable. Someone else might believe that truths are relative to cultural contexts or to paradigms or to what I've called interpretive communities. Those would be philosophical positions or epistemological positions. Hmm, Josh Cohen, are you there? I'm here, though I think I lost... Uh, Stanley, we, we lost Stanley. Stanley. We're going to get him back in, in just a second. I lost his point earlier, then I lost his voice. But. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> not fair. He's not here. You can't be, you can't be slinging arrows when he's not uh, no. here. Well, let me ask you yeah. if you share his description of what counts as a philosophical question. I don't share his disagreement, to, uh, share his view about what counts as a philosophical question, and I, I think there are two points of disagreement. Uh, maybe the disagreement is terminological, but you are trying to uh, get the terminology clear uh, here. So one point of disagreement is that uh, there's a great deal of uh, philosophical argument over the history of moral and political philosophy, which addresses what Stanley Fish is calling substantive moral questions, indeed virtually the entirety of the history of moral and political philosophy up until the early 20th century, was devoted precisely to efforts to address substantive moral and political questions. For example, questions like what rights people have, what the best life is, uh, when people are entitled to resist, why the rule of law is a good thing. So those have all traditionally been the stuff of philosophical disagreement. So I think it's a bit of arbitrary legislation on um, Stanley's part to uh, push those questions to the side. That's the first point. The second point is that I think that, that, the, that there are connections between the kinds of questions that he's describing as philosophical or, or purely philosophical. Uh, epistemological questions, questions about the nature of moral and political discourse, and substantive moral and political uh, positions. So, for example, uh, if somebody says, um, I think that the slaughter of innocents on September 11th of last year was wrong, and I think that it's wrong because it's in tension with or incompatible with the American way of life. That's what makes it wrong. And that person apparently thinks that if the American way of life changed so that killing, slaughtering innocents was part of the American way of life, then from that point forward it would be okay to slaughter innocents. And that point of view strikes me as morally as preposterous, and I'm sure Stanley Fish agrees with that. Um, but I think it's a point of connection between a position about the nature of moral and political discourse, what he's calling an epistemological position, and a position about the substance of moral uh, and political discourse. Well, let me do this, um, since we're still having a little trouble getting Stanley Fish. I'm going to play the part of Stanley Fish right now. And um, I'm going to argue that while something may be true, while it may be true that the slaughter of innocents is wrong, um, but the, you know, the proposition, the slaughter of innocents is wrong, is true. There is no way to demonstrate the truth of that proposition um, that will necessarily be convincing to all reasonable people. So it could be right. It's not that, it's not that the absolute truth can't exist, but it's just that we all can't necessarily get there by the same means. Now, is that different from what you just explained as, you know, an example of, of sort of we'll change our minds and decide it's okay and then it'll be okay? Um, I'm not sure about w what exactly you mean by we can't all necessarily get there by the same means. I suppose we might get there by uh, different means. But I think in the case at issue, there's a very co there are very complicated substantive moral questions about when, if at all, it's permissible to kill innocent people. 
um, everyone who believes that war is sometimes justified, that is, everyone who's not a committed moral pacifist, thinks that it's okay sometimes to kill innocent people because, as Secretary Rumsfeld said in a particularly ugly formulation yesterday, still the substance of what he said is right, uh, the, you kill, the death of innocent people is an inevitable consequence of the conduct of war. There's a related question, which is really the question about terrorism, which is, when is it okay not only to um, kill innocent people as a consequence of the conduct of war, but when is it okay to target innocent people? When is it okay to make the point and purpose of your use of force the killing of innocent people? And there are very deep moral disagreements about whether that's ever permissible. And if it is permissible, when? Now, I think that uh, most, I would say, all reasonable people, I don't know of anyone who disputes this proposition uh, in anything that uh, is recognizable as a reasonable moral system. I don't think, I think it's an indisputable proposition that you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't target innocent people except under the most extreme circumstances when you have no other way to defend yourself. So the thesis that there's a very high burden of justification for somebody who proposes to target innocent people is, I think, a, a proposition that's undisputed. And I think it's an important proposition, and I don't think in the case of the September 11th murderers, I don't think that they, to put it coldly and bloodlessly and unemotionally, I don't think that they discharge that burden of justification. Stanley Fish, let me ask you to uh, jump back in. I'm sorry that uh, we lost you for a few minutes there. Um, but why don't you go ahead and uh, finish your comments that you were making earlier? Well, first of all, how much of them did you hear? <laughs> <laughs> I heard up to your you were beginning to distinguish between ethical questions and philosophical questions. Uh, yes, uh, and, and again, my only uh, uh, assertion is that from philosophical questions, or what I call, and others call epistemological questions, uh, nothing follows in the way of behavior, attitudes, uh, character, or anything else. Uh, so I would distinguish between uh, ethical propositions like uh, one man, one vote, or the rule of law, not men, or well, there should be equal opportunities uh, for persons independent of their racial, ethnic, or, or religious background, or don't kill uh, innocent people. All of those are propositions of a kind from which, as Professor Cohen uh, has said correctly, uh, certain things follow. Uh, not only uh, certain kinds of actions, uh, but the justification, uh, or the attempted justification, of the actions that you don't take. So that in posing this counterexample to me, it's not a counterexample to anything that I've said. I'm talking about propositions on the level of theories of truth, such as truth is a matter of correspondence with facts that are independently specifiable, or alternatively, uh, truths are relative to cultures or epistemes or paradigms or interpretive communities. And so you have a fairly narrow definition, or using a fairly, na fairly narrow definition, of what counts as a philosophical question. Well, the reason that I uh, have this definition, at least on this occasion, has to do with the original occasion of my piece in the New York Times and later in the responsive community. People were arguing in editorials and essays that postmodernism, that is a set of epistemological propositions, had consequences for the general culture and for the persons who believed in those propositions. And my argument is, very simply, that postmodernism, a set of propositions about truth, fact, evidence, and interpretation, is not a substantive moral point of view, and does not itself entail any substantive moral points of view. Nothing follows from your holding postmodern tenets except the fact that you don't hold anti-postmodern tenets. And nothing follows from your holding anti-postmodern tenets except for that fact. So that, as I said a moment ago, it's quite different to say something like, I believe in equal opportunity uh, for persons irrespective of their religious or uh, sexual or gender identities, and I believe 
that truth, let us say, is relative to cultural context. Once you've said the second, I believe that truth is relative to cultural context, and then you're faced with the question of whether or not something is or is not true, your belief that truth is relative to cultural context will have nothing to do with the way you go about proceeding to determine whether you believe that something particular and mundane is true. That's the entire argument. Okay, let me ask you to clarify the view that truth is relative to cultural context. Is, I'm, I'm is not going to argue the view. No, 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 but I just want to say that that is a postmodern answer yeah, to that, the question. Yeah, that, okay. that, that's, that's a view often identified with postmodernism. That is, instead of believing that truth is a matter of some kind of uh, pr procedure, scientific or otherwise, that will determine the facts independently of uh, any cultural or religious or educational differences, postmodernists of a certain stripe will argue no. Uh, what is and or is not true will always be cultural or perspectival or depend, to use the language of J.L. Austin, on some dimension of assessment. And will, in fact, say that only within dimensions of assessment or vocabularies of description can something be true and fa or false. So, therefore, the idea of something that is just simply true doesn't make any sense. That's a postmodern tenet. I don't want to argue it. I don't want to argue against it. All I want to say is that you can either believe or disbelieve it, agree with it or disagree with it. But that agreement or disagreement will have no relationship whatsoever to your empirical attempt to decide or determine whether something is or is not true. Joshua Cohen, do you think for you that an empirical attempt to decide if something is or is not true does depend on your answers to those sorts of questions? Let me say two things in response. First of all, uh, I'll, I will defer uh, to Stanley Fish on the commitments of postmodernists. Uh, he's closer to that point of view than I am. and. Um, and as, he's, as he says, he's not really endorsing that point of view for the purposes of this argument, but simply saying something about what consequences it has. I should say on the first point, though, that the, the presentation, as I have read it in the debate that we had in the journal, The Responsive Community, does make a more general claim about the relationship between epistemological disagreements and moral political disagreements, not just the point about postmodernism. That's, that's, correct. that's, that's correct. really neither here nor there, I think, for our purposes. The second point that's really the more important one. Uh, so in the original uh, statement of uh, Stanley Fish's position in the journal, The Responsive Community, he says, uh, the basis for condemning what was done on September 11th is not some abstract vocabulary of justice, truth, and virtue, attributes claimed by everyone, including our enemies, and disdained by no one, but the historical reality of, our, of the way of life, our way of life, that was the target of a massive assault. Now, I, I can't help but read that as having substantive implications for moral and political argument. I think that the basis for condemning what was done on September 11th is, in part, though only in part, an abstract vocabulary of justice. It's the vocabulary of justice that social and political critics in the United States often uh, appeal to. It's the vocabulary of justice that Martin Luther King appealed to when he said that justice would roll down like the waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. He wasn't talking about the historical reality of our way of life. He was talking about what was wrong with the historical reality of our way of life. If Stanley Fish believes that the basis for condemning what happened on September 11th is the historical reality of our way of life, then I think it follows from that that if our way of life changes and changes in such a way as to condone the intentional murder of innocence, then the intentional murder of innocence is okay. Maybe this is an incautious formulation, but it strikes me as a profoundly objectionable one. Stanley Fish, what's your response? Um, the uh, statement by Professor Cohen assumes that uh, I'm talking about invoking uh, the history of our way of life as a justification. What I'm saying is that all of us who are uh, the products and heirs of 200 years of the democratic adventure in the United States have internalized a set of uh, notions uh, which have names like equal opportunity, one man, one vote, uh, non-discriminatory policies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have internalized them, and when we see an assault on them, that is, on an assault on the institutions which 
are informed uh, by those ideas. We see them as an assault on ourselves and on everything we believe in, on everything that we have come to believe in by virtue of our education, by the books that we have read, by the authorities that we revere, sometimes by the religious teachings that we adhere to. That's all I mean, and that we do not need any kind of additional supplement in some abstract vocabulary, which would in fact be also claimed by others and would become uh, the object of dispute and contest itself. I, I, I don't, don't understand Wait, that. wait, wait, I, I haven't finished. Apologies, I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. Now, in, and, and the second part of Professor Cohen's statement uh, seems to me uh, to make a basic mistake uh, to which philosophers are prone. Uh, it's to imagine situations other than they now are, and then to ask me or you, what would I do if things weren't as they are now? That seems to me to be a nonsensical procedure. If, in fact, it turned out that my views, or Professor Cohen's views, about the killing of innocents were to change what would have also changed at the same time was the whole system of justification by which I could defend and elaborate those views. And if that system of justification did change, of course it would be all right, because I would have become someone different than I am now, or Professor Cohen would have become someone different than he is now. Asking hypothetical questions into the future about sets of conditions that do not now exist is like projecting yourself back into ancient Greece and saying to yourself, would I have condoned slavery at that time? It is a nonsensical question. Stanley Fish is the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Our other guest today is Joshua Cohen, who teaches political science and philosophy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We're going to be taking some phone calls a bit later in the program, so if you would like to join in our conversation about philosophy and its relationship to practical action. All right, Joshua Cohen, you had some objections to what Stanley Fish was saying? I don't understand this. Um, dismissal of the, the so-called abstract vocabulary of justice. Uh, you find it in the preamble to the Constitution. Uh, you find it in the statements of someone like uh, Martin Luther King. About You find it in every important political movement in the history of the country, an appeal to an abstract vocabulary of justice. You find it in the abolitionists. You find it in the civil rights movement, as in the case of King. You find it in movements for workers' justice in uh, the early 20th century in the United States and uh, continuing, though regrettably, in, to a diminished degree in the later 20th and into the 21st century. You find it in movements for gender justice, and you find it in movements for justice uh, in treatment of people on the basis of sexual orientation. So the, the dismissal of the abstract, of abstract vocabularies strikes me as... Uh, the, entirely unwarranted and a very much a practical, political, substantive consequence of the epistemological position that uh, Stanley Fish is sometimes uh, describing in these pieces and sometimes seems to be uh, endorsing. As to the dismissal of asking hypothetical questions about the future, I have a pretty good idea about what would happen if I went to the parking garage when I left here and somebody had stolen my car. Um, you know, I'd call the cops and try to get a ride home. It, 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 it's not that, that's it, disingenuous. It's not hold on, hold on. Well, no, it's disingenuous. No, well, it's uh, excuse me, Stanley. It's disingenuous to make a general condemnation of appeals to uh, 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 hypotheticals and uh, speculations yeah, about what would happen. The hypotheticals that I was objecting to were the ones which say something like this. Suppose all your ideas were now to change. The ideas that you have now, what then? That's quite different, it seems to me, from saying, suppose I was going to go to, go to the parking lot and find that my car wasn't there. Okay. You know what, Stanley Fish, let me ask you to address uh, the other parts of the yeah, question. Okay, that sure. have to do all right. Okay. All right. Look, I never... Uh, have said to dismiss the vocabulary of abstraction, for example, the vocabulary of justice. They seem, voc uh, words like justice, uh, fairness, phrases like equal opportunity, individual rights, all seem to me to be rhetorically powerful. They do not, however, seem to me to stand for anything that can be specified independent 
of someone's substantive or political agenda. That is why I said in the piece that this vocabulary will be claimed by everyone. It is claimed by everyone because senses of justice or fairness of equal or equal opportunity will always be disputable. And persons who have a substantive desire for a certain outcome will always be able to find a way to argue that that outcome satisfies, the outcome they desire satisfies the conditions of justice. Abstractions of the kind that Professor Cohen and I are speaking about are, I believe, rhetorical adjuncts to substantive political programs. You invoke them, and I don't mean insincerely, you believe in them, but they are inseparable from the substantive agenda the political agenda that you then wish to prosecute. They cannot be used as a corrective or a guide in relation to that agenda. So let me, wait, hold on, can I translate that into lay terms and see if I understand it? You can't invoke, you're saying that you, you can't invoke an abstract notion of justice because your idea of justice is already filled in by what you think justice is. Right, you can invoke it, but your invocation of it, and this is the only point I made in the New York Times piece, will not be persuasive to someone uh, who doesn't have the same substantive political agendas that you have. He or she will have a different notion of justice, which doesn't mean that justice is inoperative or that it is not politically or rhetorically powerful. It's very politically or rhetorically powerful. It just doesn't do any work except for the work of cheerleading, and it's work that both sides can participate in. Joshua Cohen? Yeah, two points. First of all, um, well, actually three points. First of all, uh, the same point could be made about the vocabulary of the historical reality of our way of life. It's another mantle that people wrap themselves in, and people have deeply different uh, views about that. So that observation doesn't distinguish appeals to the American way of life from appeals to the abstract vocabulary of justice. That's the first point. The second point is that it's not really quite right to say that uh, you, a, a person's views about what is just and unjust are completely wrapped up in their political program. If that were true, then it would have been very hard to get people who have very widely different political views across the world to condemn what happened on September 11th. The attack on September 11th was condemned by it was condemned by Islamic fundamentalists who don't agree with the particular extreme, over-the-edge Wahhabi form of fundamentalism that's endorsed by al-Qaeda. So it's not true that views about justice are just ways of rhetorically masking or rhetorically uh, table-thumping your substantive political agenda. They do provide some kind of common ground among people who have very different substantive political agendas. Finally, uh, if appeals to abstract ideas like equal opportunity are rhetorical strategies for thumping the table, going in for a little rhetorical maneuvering, and maybe winning a few people over to your side, the same precise point can be made about appeals to the uh, the, the idea that our moral and political views are founded outside the historical reality of our way of life, that they are absolutely true throughout the history of political movements in the United States. Every one of the political movements that I described earlier, from the abolitionists, the feminist movement, to the movement for workers' justice, the civil rights movement, every one of those movements had a strong strand of saying that the practices of this country are absolutely wrong, that they are objectively wrong. Now, that may be just table thumping. It may be just a rhetorical maneuver, but it's a powerful rhetorical maneuver that makes a difference to how people act, and it's in that respect indistinguishable from what Stanley Fish says about substantive moral convictions about, say, equal opportunity or one person, one vote, or a commitment to liberty, the rule of law and rights. So once more, the distinction between the philosophical positions and the substantive political positions disappears. I still don't have a grip on it. No, you don't. And here's why. I agree with everything that you said in the last couple of minutes, that these rhetorical strategies, and by, for me, by the way, rhetorical is not a bad word. It doesn't mean masking at all. But these rhetorical strategies are powerful, and they do make a difference. 
And in fact, the vocabularies of justice and equal rights and equal opportunity have done extraordinary work, as I think both you and I would agree. My point, and I return to it, is that is quite different from the kind of epistemological argument that I instanced before, where you have a definition of truth or a definition of evidence or a statement about the contextuality of fact versus the independent specifiability of fact. It is abstractions on that level which I argue do not have any consequences whatsoever for either practical action or even practical thought. It was the assertion and indeed accusation that postmodern tenets, which are tenets on that level, tenets on that level with no substantive or moral or political agendas including in them, the attack was that postmodern tenets lead people to be unable to respond to terrorist attacks or to condemn them. And my point was that postmodern tenets lead people to nothing except an affirmation of postmodern tenets as opposed to others in a philosophical argument. Okay, That's we, we the need to only take another thing break. I've ever said. We need to take another break, and when we come back, we'll continue our conversation. We'll also take a few phone calls at one 888 859-1800. Give us a call if you'd like to join in our conversation. I'm Gretchen Helfrich, and you're listening to Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. Odyssey from Chicago Public Radio. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Today on the program, we are talking about philosophical inquiry and its consequences. We're joined by Joshua Cohen from the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Stanley Fish from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Stanley Fish, can I ask you a, a clarifying question? Mm -hmm. Okay, so a, a postmodern view, what a, a, a postmodern view would be that the, the concept of justice has no content except in specific cultural contexts? That might be a postmodern view, yeah, that would be a, that's right. Okay. But, but since we all live in a po in, in particular context, right. we're going to have a concept of justice, we're going to believe in it, and we're going to urge it. Let me, let me well, try wait, wait, Hang one. on, hang on, because th that, was, that was only the first part of the clarifying question. Right. Because now I want to talk about arguing or trying to persuade. If yeah. person A says to person B, um, my program is more in conformity with the abstract concept of justice than yours. Than yours. Yeah. Um, where are we? Do we just say nope? They're the same. Well, no. Persuasion is possible. Uh, for example, there were there was uh, a strategy which was employed uh, uh, during the uh, post civil rights era, where the equal rights. Uh, amendment for women was being debated, and later uh, the same strategy was employed when the issue of gay and lesbian rights uh, was being debated. And that strategy was to say to people who, let us say, had marched in the civil rights uh, battles of the 40s, 50s, and early 60s, uh, to say to them, look, you took this position in the 40s and 50s and 60s uh, with respect to race. Uh, you should now extend that position. It's a logical extension of that position uh, to matters either of gender or sexual orientation. Now, that is an argument that might work. It might not work. If it did work, of course, persuasion would have occurred, and you would have succeeded in altering someone's sense of what is just by appealing to his earlier standing up for what he or she thought was just. And you might, in fact, fail. The person to whom you made that argument, my argument, might say, no, I distinguish those cases uh, in the following ways, and then make a set of arguments. So that persuasion, uh, which is the game that we're always engaged in, and, and as I've said elsewhere, is the only game in town. The thing to know about persuasion is, is that it's contingent. It might work, and it might not work, and indeed rhetorical, rather abstract values, or the uh, naming of abstract values like loyalty and uh, justice often has a great deal to do with whether or not someone is persuaded. Does that clarify it at all? Yes, but I now have another question, and that is, 
It seems to me that you could make the claim that it's disingenuous to say to a person, your notion of justice required this from you in the 1450s, um, or your notion of what conformed with the abstract category of justice led you to do this in the 40s and 50s. Now you should do this if you, the postmodernist, uh, doesn't believe in an abstract category of justice. Yes, but the point is that when you're doing that, you, you're making the, the, the basic mistake of thinking that your beliefs on an epistemological level either hang over or influence or have scope over your activities when you're not debating philosophy. I might, again, believe that facts uh, are relative to particular context, but when someone asks me whether such and such is or is not a fact, I don't go to my belief about facts. I go to all of the ordinary ways by which facts are validated for me. Uh, perceptions, statistics, uh, surveys, uh, authorities, etc. So that what you're trying to do is what I'm continually resisting, importing your beliefs or one's beliefs on the epistemological level into situations where epistemological issues are not at stake. And I am saying that no one actually really does that. Another way to say that is that no one can live out the philosophy, uh, if it is a philosophy, of postmodernism. Remember, some of the key words in postmodernism are dispersal, fragmentation, multiple meanings, in, in innumerable perspectives, etc., etc., etc. You can make arguments, I could make arguments, for all of those postmodern concepts, but I can't live a life that is fragmented or dispersed or without meaning in which my views change from moment to moment. So that my conviction, or the conviction that I have that some post modernist arguments are better than the anti-postmodernist arguments doesn't spill over into my convictions about anything else. All right, let's take a phone call. Let's talk with Jason. Hello, Jason. You're on Odyssey. Hi. Good, good, good afternoon. Um, I'm a philosophy professor here at DePaul University. I teach in a postmodernist department, um, in a department that champions deconstructionism. I want to make some just very general inflammatory statements about postmodernism, which I believe fervently that I'm sort of I'm working out in a book called um, The uh, American Mind, an obituary. And then I want to give very, very specific um, responses to Professor Fish's uh, oh, position. Don't, don't okay. give us your book here. Yeah, can we just have a question from you? Um, the uh, I want to say, first of all, that I teach undergraduates and I teach graduate students what, what postmodernism actually accomplishes. It's like being in, an, in a conceptual asylum. It, it, it produces cognitive cripples who, um, in a classroom, are faced with a kind of intellectual inertia and paralysis who are, d d uh, d are, are prohibited from utilizing any of their, the, the cognitive skills that one has in making and adjudicating among truth claims. Um, to get to the I also want to say that one thing I, I do find among postmodernists is that they are conceptual thieves in the sense that they steal the moral vocabularies from the history of moral philosophy in order to justify whatever moral position they might have at Stan a particular moment. I have Stanley, I he's, he's, he's not getting anywhere near a question. Go ahead, Stanley. What's your response to those comments? Well, look, I, first of all, I believe that... Uh, Classrooms are full of people who now say things like, my view is as good as yours, or isn't everything political, and things like that. And I've written uh, very strongly against that. I don't believe that that uh, set of notions, uh, which in fact are, real, are usually alibis for non-performance in the classroom, are the products of postmodernist philosophy or anti-postmodernist philosophy. Again, I want to say that the fact that some people will, at a certain moment, assert a relativist view as a way of avoiding making a decision or taking a stand on something doesn't mean that that person is, in fact, a relativist, which would mean that he or she held his or her own views at a distance or in an indeterminate mix with the views of others. Relativism, like postmodernism, is a set of philosophical propositions. It is not something that anyone could live out or use to help him or her in a particular situation. If I say, should I buy Intel? There are ways in which I can make that decision, and you, we all know what they are. Suppose I'm trying to decide whether I should leave my spouse. I might 
argue with myself in relation to notions like fidelity and loyalty versus pleasure. All of those are recognizable situations in which we exercise our judgments empirical and moral. I cannot think of any particular moral or political situation in which, in order to help ourselves, we asked ourselves, what is my theory of truth? Am I a postmodernist or am I an anti-postmodernist? Right, it Josh would Cohen. always be irrelevant. Josh Cohen, yes. what are your responses? Well, I, somehow I feel that this is an intramural dispute, and Stanley's doing pretty well for himself in it. Uh, but I'll say uh, two things. First of all, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I teach at uh, MIT, and I, I don't think, at least among undergraduates, there's a, a postmodernist. At least none of them have really read any of it. And but there are lots of relativists in the classrooms, and I think the kind of relativism that uh, Jason is describing that he meets up with with students at DePaul University is the kind of thing that you expect and want students to bring to a classroom. They want an answer to the question uh, whether or not there's any good reason for endorsing the views that they have. Their question isn't the product of postmodern conviction. They're, I'm sure they're unfamiliar with postmodernism. Their question is a product of the kind of reflection that you want kids who are 18, 19, 20, or for that matter, people who are 40, 50, and 60 to continue to have. The second thing is as to the uh, the contribution of uh, postmodernism. I mean, we could go on at some length about the trouble that uh, postmodernism uh, creates, particularly in the absence of good editorial skills in most publishing firms. <laughs> but uh, that, putting that aside, I think the major contribution, the positive contribution that postmodernism, postmodernists. Uh, forget about the doctrine, people who I know who are postmodernists, the major intellectual contribution that they make is that they ask questions that nobody else in the room is asking. They often think harder about stuff. They're, 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 they're more attentive to the downside of using conventional vocabularies for thinking about important issues. And in that respect, they play the kind of role that uh, Stanley Fish plays in the piece in The Responsive Community, which is to say, the role of uh, intellectual and political provocateur, and I say that as a term of high praise. Right, Stanley I... Fish writes this, and he makes us start thinking before we talk. Let's That's take another phone service. call. Let's talk with David. Hello, David. You're on Odyssey. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I, I, it seems to me that, there's a, that Stanley Fish is making the following claim, and it seems like a claim that's demonstrably false. So let me say the claim. The claim is that your theory of truth can have no bearing on how you assess moral claims. And if this is the claim he's making, it seems to me false, and demonstrably so, here's how we demonstrate it. Can you demonstrate it quickly? Sure. Okay. Take, take the following theory of truth. A statement is true for us if and, only as, if and only if most of us agree to it. And moreover, this is the only kind of truth there is. Okay, it's a sort of a boneheaded relativist theory of truth. Okay, a sort of unsubtle relativist theory of truth. Imagine we accept that as our theory of truth, or I accept that as my theory of truth. Now let's consider a moral claim. Here's a moral claim. It's morally okay to eat meat to eat animals, okay? If it follows, it follows from, you now imagine I take a poll, right? I take a poll and it turns out most Americans think it's morally okay to eat animals. It follows from my theory of truth that that claim, it's, it's morally okay to eat animals, is true. Because according to the theory of truth that most of us believe that it's true. So on that theory of truth, the way I could assess this moral claim, is it morally okay to eat animals, would that be by taking a poll? But that's not, in fact, how we do assess moral claims. And anyone who thought so would be would fail to have the concept. Of, I agree. Of that that is a, in no way the way in which we assess uh, moral claims. Uh, and you are, of course, assuming uh, that I would approve the theory of truth. Uh, first of all, look, if I'm asked the question, should I or should I not eat meat, I'm going to consult uh, the issue of the New York Times, that a magazine that appeared two weeks ago, and then some of the essays and books referenced in that essay. I'm also going to read uh, my scriptures. If I happen to believe in scriptures, I will consult with my doctor. Uh, I will then uh, decide whether or not to eat meat. I will not, in the course of making that decision, uh, think about what my theory of truth is. That's the only claim that I'm making, that one's theory of truth, one's theory of truth, that the answer that you might give to someone who said to you, What's your theory of truth? That theory of truth has no relationship whatsoever to the answer that you might give if you were asked, 
do you think so-and-so's interpretation of this poem is truer than so-and-so's? If you were asked that kind of question, you'd look at the poem, uh, you'd look at the background evidence, uh, you'd uh, weigh the particular uh, arguments made by each side, and then you would decide you would never go to your theory of truth if you were so curious a person as to have one. Okay, we have just a few minutes left. I want to ask this final question to each of you. Why do you suppose, Joshua Cohn, I'll start with you, um, if, uh, why do you suppose that people view postmodernism as so enfeebling of, of moral resolve? Well, I, I think that there are, I, I, I think Stanley Fish had his finger on something, not the right thing that he identified, he didn't identify it rightly, but I think he had his finger on something very important in the piece in the responsive community. I think that there were lots of people in the wake of September 11th who were saying things like, why do those people hate us so much? What's going on there? Why did they do this? Who are trying to gain some kind of understanding. Uh, and to understand all is not to forgive all. They were trying to get some kind of understanding of what provoked, prompted this attack. And other people thought that there was something wrong even with asking that question. And they thought that it was sufficient unto the evil to say, these people are bad, they're terrorists, they're evil, that's the end of the day. And they thought that if you ask the question, what's driving these people, that that itself would weaken the resolve of the country in uh, responding to the uh, September 11th attack. And I think a number of the people who were at asking that kind of question, completely legitimate, absolutely the right thing to do, were probably uh, postmodernists. So you had a few people swing in with philosophical clubs against postmodernism because they objected to the substantive questions that they were uh, uh, asking. And I think it was extremely unfortunate, or unfortunate because those questions were entirely legitimate and haven't been uh, really answered in any kind of satisfactory way yet. Joshua Cohen teaches political science and philosophy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Stanley Fish, we only have about 15 seconds for I agree that with question. Joshua's answer to that question, but I would also say that there's a general fear of uh, any set of arguments uh, that seems uh, to people to remove an absolute foundation for their beliefs. And if you punch in postmodernism into the Internet, Google, or other, or other server, what you will find are articles in which people are, in fact, saying that postmodernism and cultural relativism are killing our country and eviscerating our way of life and corrupting our children. That's a very strong uh, belief, and it has something to do with traditions of anti-intellectualism in this country, which go back a very long way. Stanley Fish is the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Stanley Fish, Joshua Cohen, thank you both very much for joining me today. Thank you, Gretchen. Thanks. Thanks to everyone for listening and for calling. Odyssey's theme music is composed and performed by OK Go. Thanks to our research assistant, Allison Rinnick, and to Ernst Carroll for engineering our program today. Odyssey is produced by Delia Lloyd and Allison Cuddy. Our technical producer is Steve Waranowskis. The senior producer of Odyssey is Joshua Andrews. Odyssey is a production of Chicago Public Radio under general manager Tori Malatia. I'm Gretchen Helfrich. Join us again next time for Odyssey.